Dear congregation, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 2 that he determined not to know anything among them but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Uh, Paul is basically saying there that he is a man of one subject. He could have been taken up with other subjects, but he fixed his heart and mind on this one subject of Christ and him crucified. It's what we all need. It's what we need to come back to time and again. It's what Peter needed to learn, and how he learned it is told in our text as we listen to Christ and Him crucified. We'll see, first of all, confessing the person of Christ, secondly, revealing the work of Christ, and thirdly, rebu rebuking a disciple of Christ, Christ and Him crucified. First of all, confessing the person of Christ, secondly, revealing the work of Christ, and thirdly, rebuking a disciple of Christ. The Lord Jesus, together with his disciples, have traveled 25 miles north from Bethsaida to the remote and impressive city of Philippi, of Caesarea Philippi and its surrounding villages. It's 125 miles from Jerusalem in the upper limits of the land near the foot of Mount Hermon. It's a Gentile region dominated by Rome. Herod the Great had named it Caesarea after the Roman Emperor Caesar Augustus, and he had built a beautiful temple in honor of Caesar. It was a pagan city given to the worship of idols, and it's against this pagan Gentile backdrop where the Lord Jesus is going to bring his disciples to make a confession about who he is, just like we are called to confess his name in an idol-worshipping world. Yes, the Lord Jesus has been with his disciples for some time now, and they are going to be witnesses of him. And so he asks about what others say about him. Yes, and then he'll ask what they think of him. First, he asks what others are saying about him. The end of verse 27, uh, what do people say about me? Who do men say that I am? Crowds of people have seen him. They've listened to him. People have heard about him. People were talking about him. Now, what were the current prevailing opinions and ideas about Jesus. What were the common opinions about him? And the disciples can tell him about some of the opinions that people have about Jesus. Some said he was John the Baptist. That was Herod's opinion. Mark 6 verse 16 tells us that. He was John the Baptist. He, after all, John was not afraid of calling sin, sin. And, and warning of the judgment to come. And he was honest with sinners and bold and fearless. That would cost him his life, just like it would cost the life of the Lord Jesus. Christ's ministry awakened echoes of John's ministry. Others thought he was maybe Elijah, also a fire and brimstone preacher who had performed miracles like the Lord Jesus he had fed the multitude, he had raised the dead, and the Old Testament had ended with the prophet Malachi saying that Elijah would come and would prepare the way of the Lord. Still others said that he was one of the prophets. And as we listen to these opinions, it's clear that the Lord Jesus, for a large part, was held in high regard. Others had called him a glutton. Still others had called him a blasphemer. There were those who hated the Lord Jesus and were critical of the Lord Jesus, but others held the Lord Jesus in high regard and considered him on par with some of the greatest prophets that Israel had known. And if they had said that about you and me, that would be quite flattering. If people considered you among the best of the prophets, that would be quite a compliment. 
And that's what people today are willing to say about the Lord Jesus. He did a lot of good, they'll say. He gave a good example. He was a good teacher. Islam is willing to say the Lord Jesus is a great prophet. Many are willing to honor Jesus as a great teacher, as an honorable man. But if Jesus is only like Elijah and John the Baptist, then he is but a man. And we may call certain men great, powerful preachers, bold, unafraid people maybe but they're still children of Adam, sinful men. And if we only think of the Lord Jesus as a man, then our opinion, however flattering it may sound and however different it may be from those who are prepared to mock him, we still don't go far enough if we just consider him on par with John the Baptist and Elijah because he is no mere man. And unless... We bow before Him and trust Him, for life and salvation will perish in hell. But now what do the disciples of Jesus think about Him? That's what the Lord Jesus really wants to come to. After all, they are going to be witnesses of Jesus in the world in which He is going to send them. So verse 29, He asks, But who do you say that I am? What's your opinion? What do you think about me? They've had plenty of time to consider who he is. They've followed him. They've heard him. They've seen his power. They've seen his love. They've seen his grace. And then Peter, who was usually the first one to open his mouth, he speaks, Thou art the Christ. And then it's clear that this is a breakthrough moment in Peter's life. Andrew His brother had told Peter in John 1, 41, we have found the Christ. And all this time, Peter has been considering it, and he agrees, and he says it to the Lord Jesus. And this is the first time in Christ's public ministry that a human being has said it to Jesus. The devils have said it, but no man has said it to him yet. Here Peter says that thou art the Christ. He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the anointed one, anointed to be prophet and priest and king. Yes, he would be king. After all, he's the great son of David. The king is here in the person of Jesus. He's the great governor of his people, the defender of his people, the ruler of his people. He's the king, and he is the prophet, the final prophet, the one who fully reveals the secret counsel and will of God concerning our redemption, Lord's Day 12 says. He's king, and he's prophet, and he is the priest. Maybe Peter had not thought about that so much, that Jesus would be the great priest, who would not just bring a lamb or a bull to the altar, but he would give his own life a ransom for many on the altar of the cross. Now, Peter doesn't understand everything. And that seems to be the reason, at least one of the reasons, why the Lord Jesus in verse 30 will charge them to secrecy. They need further instruction. They need to learn that he is the Christ who is to be crucified. And what misunderstandings there would be if Christ was preached without the cross. No, Peter doesn't understand everything. But he knows this and he believes this. Jesus is the Christ. Now, how does Peter know? The Lord Jesus will explain it in Matthew's gospel that it's not because he was exceptionally intelligent or that Peter had keen insight in himself. No, this confession does not result out of human origin. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to him. The Father has been teaching him. The Father has illumined his mind and by the Holy Spirit working secretly in his soul. 
The Father has brought Peter to see this and to believe this and to confess this. And I wonder this morning if you agree with Peter's confession, with your heart and with your soul. I trust that there are also young people in this congregation who are planning or hoping to make confession of faith soon. Well, what do you think of Christ, young people? You've had plenty of time to make up your mind. Young people, what do you think about him? What's your verdict about him? Is he the Christ? Is he your prophet? Is he your priest? Is he your king? Is he your savior? What, what do you say about him? And even if others are not prepared to make this confession, even if others disagree with this confession, like the religious leaders in the days of Jesus, yet don't expect this confession to be popular. But young people, whoever will confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. What do you think of Christ? We don't want to get this question wrong. And that's why, young people, have you never asked the Lord to draw you to Him, to open your eyes, to make you know that to live is Christ, that you would love Him and trust Him, confess him and follow him yes first of all confessing the person of Christ secondly revealing the work of Christ revealing the work of Christ the the time has come for the Lord Jesus to explain to his disciples what he has come to do what his mission is and the heart of it is this in verse 31 that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed. Now that's quite an announcement that he makes. And the disciples, they find it hard to understand, but Christ's announcement is clear. Up till now, the Lord Jesus have, has given hints about his upcoming suffering and death. He spoke those words, remember, at the cleansing of the temple, John 2, verse 19. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it again. But those were veiled words. Those were hidden words. Those weren't really clear. And the disciples didn't understand them. And yes, in Matthew 12, verse 40, he has compared himself to the prophet Jonah, who was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. And just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the earth, so, 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 so Jesus would be. And that wasn't clear and plain to the disciples either, but this is very plain. This is very clear. There's no doubt about what Jesus is saying. He is going to suffer many things. He's going to be rejected of the elders and of the religious leaders, and he's going to be killed. He... He spoke it openly, verse 32 says, plainly, frankly. He used great plainness of speech. But it is a surprising announcement. And there's nothing in the present situation that seems to threaten him. There was no opposition. It was not as if he was facing so much enmity uh, right now. Why does he say it? And why will he repeat this announcement three times in 8 verse 31, 9 verse 31, and Mark 10 verse 32? Because while the disciples are learning of who he is, they also need to learn what he has come to do. They need to know about his person and his work. For he's on a mission. And what he sets forth here is the heart of his mission. This is not just a little side note to his ministry or a little footnote to his ministry. This is the main 
purpose for which he came to die and rise again. And so, as verse 31 says, he began to teach them. This lesson isn't going to sink in all at once. It's not going to sink in immediately. It's going to take time. Jesus will need patience with his disciples for this message to gradually sink in that the way to glory is the way through suffering. There is agony that Christ must endure on his way to glory. That's why he must go to Jerusalem. He cannot stay in Caesarea Philippi. He cannot stay in the north. He must go south to suffer and be rejected. And not just at the hands of some street gangs or some rioters or some homeless people, but suffer and be rejected by the religious leaders, by the a chief priests and elders and scribes who will meet him with unbelief, who will mock him, who will spit upon him. For this Jesus was not the kind of Messiah they were looking for. Suffering awaits him. And death awaits him. He will be killed. Isaiah 53 verse 8. He will be cut off out of the land of the living. He will have to go into death. He'll have to face the fears of dying. He will be put to death. How does he know this? It's what he has come to do. It's what he has read in the scriptures. He knows what people will do to him. This is not just a hunch that he has. He's not just afraid or anxious that this may happen. He knows this is the way he must go. Yes, he must, verse 31 says. It's a strong word. It's not an option. It's a divine necessity. It's a must. This is the way that the Father has marked out for him to go. This is the path that the Father has ordained for him. And he said it in John 4, verse 34, My food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. He accepts the Father's will for him. He submits to his Father's will. He'll walk every step of the path set before him by his Father. His death is not an accident. His death is not a mistake. This is the purpose for which he came into the earth to die. Why? Well, he doesn't explain it here. Why will he suffer and die? No, he doesn't explain it here. But he will suffer and die not because he's done anything wrong. Not because he has sinned or because he has done something amiss. Why then? Why did he have to suffer and die? Is that maybe your prayer? Oh, teach me what it meaneth. The cross uplifted high. With one the man of sorrows condemned to bleed and die. Yes, to bleed and die. Why did he have to do that, boys and girls? Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Hebrews 9.25 1 Peter 3, verse 18, he has to die the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God. He goes this way of suffering and dying to save from death and hell. It's the only way back to God. And I wonder if you've seen that already, that you've learned to say it too with the poet Mine, mine was the transgression, but thine the deadly pain. 
And have you taken refuge to Jesus, the substitute? Suffering and rejection and death awaits him. But it's not just some gloomy picture he gives them. He adds something. He speaks about victory. He speaks about triumph. The disciples didn't seem to be listening, but he said it. That though he will suffer and be rejected and killed, verse 32, after three days he will rise again. He's not wanting his disciples to be in despair, for he will rise again from the dead on the third day. Paul says he'll be delivered for our offenses, but he'll be raised for our justification. We can have our sins forgiven because he rose again. We can have a living relationship with a living Savior because he lives. We can have hope. And comfort in our distress because he rose again. He's the one that I need. Do you? Christ and him crucified and risen. But that does take some learning as we see in our third point. Yes, there is first of all, not only the confessing the person of Christ. And secondly, revealing the work of Christ. But there is thirdly, the rebuking of a disciple of Christ. A rebuking a disciple of Christ. Peter heard the Lord Jesus and he can't believe what he's hearing. And so he takes the Lord Jesus aside just like a father might do who takes one of his children aside who's misbehaving and a frown doesn't work with his child so father takes the child aside to correct his son that that's how peter takes jesus aside and begins to rebuke jesus yes to rebuke him it's it's the same word used to describe the people who rebuked blind bartimaeus They wanted to silence Bartimaeus. It's the same word that's used of the disciples who rebuke the parents who brought their children to Jesus. Peter is not happy with Jesus at all. Matthew in his gospel in chapter 16 adds, Never, Lord, this shall never be unto thee. Absolutely not. Peter has strong words for Jesus. Now, we might be ready to uh, condemn Peter in return, and we might be ready to rebuke Peter and say, Peter, how dare you do this? Peter, if only you would think before you spoke. But it's clear that Peter does love his master. And what Jesus has said makes no sense to Peter. And why does Peter do this? Why does he take him aside? Why does he say, no, this this shouldn't happen. This can't happen for several reasons. Peter does this. Let me give three reasons why Peter says what he says. First of all, it's clear that he's not reckoning with the testimony of the Scriptures. He's not reckoning with the testimony of the Scriptures. The Scriptures are plain. That the Messiah would come to suffer. Genesis 3 verse 15. He would be bruised. Psalm 22. Isaiah 53. Just to mention a few Old Testament passages that clearly sets forth that he must suffer. And he must die in order to enter into his glory. How often don't we get How often don't we go wrong when we forget what the Lord has said in his word, friends? Let us not set the scriptures aside in our needs and in our trials and in our suffering. We need the scriptures. We need to reckon with the testimony of the scriptures, young people. Not just the things that please us but the things that maybe hurt us, not just the scriptures that speak of Christ's glory, but also the scriptures that speak of his agony. That's one reason why Peter says what he says. He's not reckoning with the testimony of the scriptures. Secondly, Peter is shrinking back from the agony of suffering. 
He's shrinking back from the agony of suffering. Oh, who would not do this? Would you not want to protect someone from suffering if you could? Would you not want to stop it if someone you loved was going to be hurt? But this cannot be stopped. It's part of Christ's mediatorial work. From all eternity, the Lord Jesus had agreed to this in the covenant of redemption, in the council of peace, agreeing with his Father that he will go and suffer. But Peter shrinks back from the agony of his suffering. And thirdly, Peter doesn't reckon with the depravity of sinners. He doesn't reckon with the depravity of sinners. He doesn't reckon with his own depravity and the depravity of others. Did he maybe forget about the depravity of others? Did he think that Jesus would not be treated like this by the elders, chief priests, scribes? Surely they won't do such things to Jesus, will they? We can forget about the total depravity of others, including the total depravity of religious leaders. And that religious leaders are by nature enemies of God and need to be born again. Or as Paul would later on say, the carnal mind is enmity against God. Has, has Peter forgotten the depravity of others, thinking, no, they won't do that to Jesus? Or does, has he forgotten about his own depravity that manifests itself here in thinking that he knows better than Jesus? After all, Remember, Peter had just made a marvelous confession of Christ, and did that maybe begin to fill him with pride, thinking, now I, I think I know a little bit now, and I, I think I know a lot now. I, maybe I think I know it all. There, there are temptations when we are low, but there are also temptations when we are high. We can forget the depravity of our own heart. Peter is a sinful man and his sins need a covering and your sins and my sins need a covering too. How can we be reconciled to God? How can we be brought back into a right relationship with God if Christ doesn't shed his blood? But as far as Peter is concerned, the suffering of the Lord Jesus isn't necessary. And Peter is ready to bypass the cross. And many people are bypassing the cross. They may be sincere people. and They may be very loving people. Peter is very sincere here. Peter loves his master here. He's full of love for his master, but my sincerity will not take away my sin. And my charity will not take away my sin. I know people are content with Jesus as a teacher, Jesus as a good example, Jesus as a counselor, but they don't see they need a suffering mediator. People want to, to know how to live better, how to be a better husband, how to be a better wife, and that's not wrong in and of itself. We all could learn more of that. But it's... Is that how you are going into eternity saying, well, I tried to be a good husband. I tried to be a good wife, a good mother. I was honest. I was sincere. That's the confession that bypasses the cross. It's a bloodless religion, friends. It bypasses the cross. And Paul knew that very well. There was a time in his life when he bypassed the cross. And he would write it to Christ crucified is through the Jews a stumbling block. And to the Greeks foolishness. Or we may be in danger of the same thing. Of bypassing the cross. What are you resting on? on your way to eternity and as you have to meet God. Well, Peter did not get very far. Verse 32 says that Peter began to rebuke Jesus. 
He began to try and dissuade Jesus from going to the cross. He had, to, he had a number of arguments that he was wanting to make, but Peter doesn't get very far, and Jesus interrupts him and says, verse 33, Get thee behind me, Satan, for you do not savor the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. You're not valuing the things of God, but the things of men. You're not setting your mind on the things of God, but the things of men. And Matthew, in his gospel account, will paint the picture of luring. Peter is luring Jesus into a trap. Yeah, behind Peter is Satan, who has set a trap for Jesus through the words of Peter. The, the voice is Simon's, but the thought is Satan's. And Peter must bear full responsibility for what he has said. He has allowed his mind to go in this way, and he may have had high motives, but the very thoughts he's had were inspired by the very devil himself. And Jesus responds the way he did when he was tempted in the wilderness in Matthew 4, verse 10, where Satan had taken Jesus, remember, up to a pinnacle and suggests that he cast himself down. He'd do something spectacular and the angels will come and bear him up in, his hand, in their hands. And then Jesus said the same thing, get behind me, Satan. Satan is offering Jesus to have glory without agony. He's offering the crown without the cross. Satan is dead set against the cross. He knows the power of the cross. How dear the cross is to the heart of God. If Satan can get the, set the cross aside, then he can have his way. And do you see how Satan can use us to oppose the wisdom of God, the will of God, and the love of God. And do you see how foolish a disciple of Jesus can be when left to himself? The one moment a disciple can make a great confession of Christ, and the next moment he can lay a serious temptation for Christ. The one moment a disciple of Jesus can be influenced by the Father and the next moment a disciple of Jesus can be influenced by Satan. The one moment he's laying the foundation for the church and the next moment he's inclined to overthrow the faith. The one moment he's a pillar in the church, the next moment he would have become a wrecking ball to the church. The one moment a disciple of Jesus can be so spiritual and the next moment he can be so carnal. One moment in Peter the new man is confessing Christ and the next moment the old man is tempting Christ. You see, there's this battle inside of Peter that he doesn't even know about. Spirit and flesh striving inside of him. And I wonder if you've ever felt this, dear child of God. How the one moment you can be spiritually minded and the next moment you can be carnally minded. The one moment making a pre precious confession and the next moment ready to fall into temptation. And we should take to heart what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12. Let him that thinketh he standeth Take heed lest he fall. Or what Peter says in 1 Peter 5 verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. If you've never seen your need to be watchful, Delighting in the law of God after the inward man, as Paul says, Romans 14. But seeing another law in your members warring against the law of your mind. Even sometimes in your noblest thoughts, your lofty ideas, with the best of intentions, you thought you were sincere, you thought you were motivated by love, but your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. 
and you may be wrong and mistaken. That's why a rebuke needs to be issued, and that's what the Lord Jesus issues. An earnest rebuke that is meant to bring Peter to his senses. It's meant to bring us to our senses. If this morning we're willing to bypass the cross, we need the rebuke of Jesus, issued in love, no doubt, and in mercy. But are we willing to receive his rebukes? Do we welcome his rebukes? As Psalm 141 verse 5 says, Let the righteous smite me, it shall be a kindness. And let him reprove me, it shall be an excellent oil. And Jesus, no, he will not let Peter keep him from the path to the cross. He will not turn aside. He will not turn away from the cross. He's ready to go the way of suffering and death. He will continue this way. He will persist in this way. He must go. He will go to the cross without hesitation and with determination driven by love and joy. For the joy that was set before him, he will go to the cross. Did Peter get it? Not really. Not here anyways. The Lord Jesus, I said, will make this announcement two other times. Uh, he'll make it a second time. He'll make it a third time. And then Luke will tell us in Luke 18 verse 34, but the disciples understood none of those things. Peter didn't get it. Not then. Not there. And when they were in the Garden of Gethsemane, remember, and the soldiers came to arrest Jesus, then Peter takes out his sword and he begins to swing. He wants to defend the Lord Jesus. And Peter needs to be broken down. And then it happened. In the hall of Caiaphas, he lied. First time. He denied that he knew Jesus a second time. And a third time. And then the rooster crowed. And then he remembered what Jesus had said. And Jesus looked in his eyes. And something broke inside Peter. And he went out and wept bitterly. And then Peter saw he could not bring himself back to God. Through his own words and through his own works. I don't know when he saw it so clearly, but he needed the blood of Jesus. And he began to savor the things that are of God. And you know which apostle, which writer in the New Testament uses the word suffering most? It's Peter. 1 Peter 3 verse 18, for instance, Christ also hath once suffered for sins the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God. Peter learned to love the cross. Peter learned to trust in the Christ who suffered and died on the cross. Peter learned to worship at the cross. Indeed, mine, mine was the transgression, but thine the deadly pain. I take refuge to him and to his cross, and I need that cross. And I determine to bring everything back to Christ and the cross because I want to know Christ and him crucified. Do you too? Have you seen your need of the cross? At one point in your life, maybe, or from a long time in your life, you lived past the cross. But the Lord has uncovered you to your sin by his spirit. And now you see who you are and what you've done. And it grieves you. And it hurts. And one time you were proud. And one time you were arrogant. But now you're humbled. And he brings you to himself. And he teaches you what it meaneth. The cross uplifted high. And the comfort is while he says... Get away, Satan. He does not say, get away, Peter. 
No, instead, come, Peter. Come, sinner. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. What are you doing with the cross? Are you bypassing the cross? Or are you bowing at the cross as a needy sinner, needing and wanting to know Christ and Him crucified? Amen.